Welcome to Westside Community Church. You're watching a message titled Hard Times by Pastor Andrew Clark. Well, good morning, Westside. Uh, my name is Andrew Clark. I'm a youth pastor down in the Grand Rapids area, and uh, I also happen to be the oldest son of Pastor John Clark. <clears throat> a lot of times people ask what it was like growing up with Pastor John as a father. Um, <clears throat> I think it's referenced as like growing up with a squirrel on crack, like... <laughs> said that, and I, I like to share stories about him. I don't really have one right now, and sometimes people say, well, do you have any daddy issues? And I say, well, yeah, I'm a pastor's kid. I have plenty of daddy issues. Um, <clears throat> but no, in all honesty, it's awesome to be here. It's, it's so fun to come from, from down south and up here. I mean, survived the earthquake and made it up um, <clears throat> so I could be here with you guys. And, uh, but it's awesome. It's so fun to come uh, to know where this started, where Westside started, and to see where it is now. And even just in the last year to see the progression from the, the new entryway to uh, the youth center being built to all the new uh, parking lot and asphalt. That's just awesome. Um, and it's so cool to see that um, and to see the progression. And, and honestly, you guys, it, it's so cool to know the leadership. Uh, yeah, I might be a little biased because it's my dad, but to know that God's blessing is in this ministry. Um, from everything down from the, the leadership to the staff to the volunteers, like what's going on here at Westside is awesome. Uh, it is definitely a gift from God, and it, it, is, it is cool uh, to be a part of it. So uh, I just want to take a moment and just thank uh, Westside, thank their staff, thanks for the opportunity. Um, but it is definitely a privilege to be here. Uh, but this morning, I want to talk to you guys about um, the idea of, of hard times. Um, and I just want to preface it by the, saying I don't know what your hard time is, Right? For some of us, a hard time or a difficult time can be many different things. In all honesty, the hardest time I've faced in the past year to six months has been actually being licensed or ordained as a minister. Um, the process for me has been a difficult one. And you think, well, why? That's, this is what your career is. This is what you want your job to be. But the process in itself of multiple papers, I haven't written a paper in three years since college, and yet I have to go back and write two or three papers. It's, it's a three-hour written test. It's an it's a hour-long, over 100-question Bible test. And then it's a three-hour oral exam over a year period. And for me, that was a really difficult time. Uh, I know looking at me, I look sleek and fit. But in all honesty, in the past couple of months, I've really added a lot of weight because for me, when I deal with a hard time, when I deal with a difficult situation, a difficult moment, I like to eat, right? We all have those things in our life that when, tough, when times get tough, uh, we just kind of turn to different things. But I, wanna, I want you to know that for me, that was a hard time. But I know for others in here, a hard time might have been the fact that you just lost a loved one, okay? That, you, that, that you're going through some trouble at work. Right? So there's, there's a whole different range of hard times. And my hope this morning is that no matter what, we realize that as believers in Christ and with a Savior and, and someone who has sent their son to die on a cross for you and I, that we can choose faith. That in the middle of a hard times, no matter what, we have a God that we can turn to who loves you, who cares about you, who appreciates you, who respects you, who holds you up. We have a God who does that for us. So if you get nothing else out of this message this morning, just remember that, that you can choose faith in the middle of your hard time. But this morning in particular, I want to talk about one man, and his name is Job. Job is a book in the Old Testament, and we'll, we'll go, if you actually want to open your Bibles, we can turn there. I just want to kind of give you a little information. Job's in the Old Testament, like I said early on. Uh, but Job, the Bible says, was an awesome guy. He was a righteous guy. He was a blameless guy. The dude had a huge farm, tons of land. In fact, if he was a farmer nowadays, he would have been a multi-millionaire extreme wealth. He had a large family, seven sons, three daughters. They spent uh, all the time together. They had the perfect Pinterest Facebook family. Whatever, the, their pictures, they're all just loving life. Like it's, it's legit. They, they would spend time together. They even say when Job would hang out with his family, he'd spend all this time with his family and then he'd leave and he'd instantly go pray for them. He was always thinking about his family. Like this dude had a lot going on for him. But this morning, he's going to be our backdrop for how we should respond in the middle of hard times. So if you turn to Job, we're going to be in chapter 1, the very first chapter. 
I'm going to read a little bit, so just bear with me. It'll be on the screen. But Job 1, and we're going to start uh, in verse 6. It says this, One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Verse 9, Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? Uh, you have blessed the work of his hands so that the flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you uh, to your face. Verse 12, the Lord said to Satan, Ev Very well, then everything he has is in your power, but the man himself do not lay a finger. Then Satan went from there from the presence of the Lord. One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the older brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen that were plowing and the donkeys that were grazing nearby, and the Sabians attacked them and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The fire of God fell from the heavens and burned up all the sheep and the servants, and I am the only one who escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword as well, and I am the only one who was able to escape. And while he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at your oldest brother's house uh, when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck down the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them, and they are dead, and I'm the only one who escaped to tell you, we'll stop there. In my notes, I literally just wrote crazy, exclamation point. Uh, let's just take a moment and, and discuss what happened, right? Job is chilling, having a nice day, I'm assuming. He knows his friends are together, he knows, or he knows his, uh, his uh, sons and daughters are together, he knows his servants are attending his flock, so as far as we know, Job's at his house just having a nice day. When he gets a knock at the door and it's some messenger to tell him, hey, the 7,000 we know in the Bible, the Bible says that he had 7,000 sheep. It's a lot of sheep eye, sheep it, sheeps, like whatever the plural for sheep is. He had a lot of them. It might just be sheep. But he had a lot of them. 7,000 of them gone. Oh, you want to borrow an ox? You go to Job. He has 500 yoke of oxen, meaning he had 1,000 oxen, meaning if you wanted to borrow an ox, Job would say, cool, take two, because I got 998 back on the farm. It's no big deal. Gone. 500 donkeys. Gone. He's got 500, no, 3,000 camels. Humps for days. <laughs> Gone. Immeasurable wealth. Everything this man has worked for, gone. And then when just so you think you'd be able to take a breath and just be able to understand what is happening, another knock comes and another messenger interrupts and says, hey, by the way, all your sons, all your daughters are gone. Think about that. That's not just your immediate family, but he's lost generations of family. He's lost lineage of family. He's lost the family name. It's gone In a blink of an eye, you want to talk about a hard time. I think we can agree Job's facing a hard time. I, I, I believe when reading that, if I was Job, why wouldn't I have every right to be mad? Why wouldn't I have every right to, to be pissed off at God and say, why would you do this to me? Why would you let this happen? Why to get angry, to run away? Why? Why, why wouldn't we be able to? I mean, that would make complete sense, right? That, would, that Job would do that. Say, forget this, I'm done. You've taken everything. Are you serious? All my blood, all my sweat, all my tears, my family, my life, everything gone. But what's so beautiful about this story is the next couple verses and Job's response and what I believe should be our response in the middle of hard times. Let's finish reading, picking up in verse 20. It says that this Job got up, tore his robe and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship in worship and said naked I come from my mother's womb and naked I will depart may the name of the Lord be praised and in all this Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing 
I actually, in my notes, go crazier. It's gone. This is a hard time. This, this is a difficult moment. This is the moment when you can say, I've had enough. Yet Job, in worship and in praise, says, no, it's all right, God. I'll praise you still. Choosing faith in the middle of hard times, it seems nearly impossible, yet Job does it right here in one of the hardest times, one of the worst experiences you can ever imagine. So I started thinking about that I, as we read this and we start talking about, okay, so for me, some, this is a difficult time. This is a difficult moment. For you, this is more of a difficult time, whatever it is, but we all go through them. But I started thinking as, as I was going through this process and I was in the, in the state of just feeling like I couldn't go on and feeling like a failure, and I started thinking, I was like, well, why haven't I been praying about this? Why haven't I been focused on this? Why, why am I just waiting till now, till I'm at the end of my rope to ask God for help? I mean, is that not us? Do we wait till the hard times, we wait till the worst situations to then say, oh yeah, God, <laughs> I need you. When the reality is we need him all the time. But why? Why do we wait? You know, you talk about priorities and I go through my list of priorities I have and I say, well, I got, I got a wife and I have two kitties and I got work and I, I got to do this and oh, I'll, I'll shove Jesus in right here. That's a good spot for him on my priority list. Oh, oh, oh I, have, I have that meeting later. And you slide them down. And our list of priorities grows to the fact when we don't even know if Jesus is on that list anymore. when we know that the reality is he should be the top of our priorities. So I go back to the question, why? Why does it take a hard time? Why does it take a terrible moment for us to lean back on him and go back to him? And so I did some research and I, I kind of put together some thoughts and it's, it's a little, little difficult of a situation, but I believe it comes down to this fact that we're human. And not only we're we human, but we are men and we are women. And men, we think one way, right? We, we like our boxes nice and neat. Each thing goes in here. We compartmentalize stuff. Don't touch my box, but I, I got this, and when I want to talk to you, I'll take that box out. We'll talk about this. I'll put it away. Put it away nice. That's how we think. Ladies, <laughs> let's talk. <laughs> Right? That, that's the thought process. <laughs> Thank you. And I started thinking about, as a man though, and, and to go back to the, the men part is, is, what do we want? What is our biggest fear? Why do we as men struggle with this idea of asking for help? Why won't we not stop and ask for directions? Why will we get ourselves more lost than just taking the two seconds it takes to say, hey, will you show me where this is? Instead, we'd rather just keep driving. Or if we got something to do and we're going to cut our hand off and I can keep going and you keep, we keep working. It says, men, we, we like the idea of being the man. Our life goal is being the man. Think about it. Superman, Batman, we want to be the man. That is our, that's our goal. We want to be bigger and badder and better than the guy next to us. I spent some time a couple weeks ago with a group of pastors, and we were talking about our ministries, and a couple of them would describe the fact that they're the only guy at their church and it's falling apart, and, and they got no help, and it's lonely, and it's scary. And, but when you offer them help, when we would say, well, how can we come along? It was, it was the Heisman. Help? I don't need help. I, this, this is fine, because what? They're the man. Honestly, guys, the, the fear of not being the man is scarier than anything we have to face being the man. In fact, the other, the other day I went uh, with my wife and I, we had to go get her oil change. And I've changed the oil a couple times in our Jeep, but she owns a little four-door Toyota Matrix. And so we go to get this thing changed and uh, the oil change and that. We go to one of those little 10-minute quick Valvoline changed places. You know, you stay in your car the whole time and they just kind of do stuff for you. You're in and out, no big deal. And so we pull in. As we're pulling in, I kind of like puff my chest up and I'm like, you know, I got to get my line down. Like, I was going to change it, but we needed you to do it faster. <laughs> Stuff like that. Like, I'm trying to work on this. 
Well, we pull in, and, and, and the guy that comes to the window is got like tattoos around his arm. He was an army veteran, served in Afghanistan. He had the sweet goatee, smelled like he just smoked a pack. He was covered in grease. Like the dude literally outmanned me in like 18 different areas. <laughs> like I just, I, I started sweating. Like I, I literally saw him. I didn't even, I didn't roll the window down all the way. Like I just like, I was like, Bing. Literally, it was like a hide your kids, hide your wife, because he's going to steal them. Like, he's that manly. So I'm like, I'm like turned in the window, like protecting so he can't see my wife. Like, there's no one in here but me. So he asked me, he's like, well, hey, will you, will you turn on the, you know, we want to see if the blinkers work. So I turn on the windshield wipers. I actually, like, sprayed the windshield wiper fluid. Like, he's like, I, I don't think that. I was like, I know, I know, I, I, I got it. Turn it on. He said, like, you pump the brakes. I like, I can pump the brakes. So I pumped that. He goes, hey, will you pop the hood? I promise you, I had never pumped the, or I had never popped the hood in this vehicle. Trust me, I had never had. He says, will you pop the hood? So I just like reach under the steering wheel. I'm like, I think it's here. He's like, I, no, no, Cole's like, I, I think it's on the door. I'm like, yeah, you're right. And I, like, I touched the floor. I'm like, Oh, it must be stuck. <laughs> I like touch the radio, nothing. I just find a button, I push it, it pops the trunk. The guy has the nerve to say, you want me to do that? I'm just, I'm feeding him my man card. Like, like I've taken it out. I've erased my name. I'll just eat it. Like, I'm just, you are better. He, in fact, he opens the door, because I can't open the door, and he pops the hood. I didn't know what to do, okay? But I was too egotistical. I was too focused on myself and making sure that I still look like a man in front of my wife and in front of this dude that I wouldn't just say, hey, man, I don't know. Will you just, will you help me? Right? Guys, I played soccer in college, so I'm a foot fairy. I, uh, I, so my favorite class in college was art, because we did art. Um, I couldn't tell you how to fix a motor. I, I go blank in there. I couldn't tell you where to start when you start fixing it, when you start building a house. I couldn't do anything else. I love kitties. I love puppies. I prefer lattes over black coffee. And guess what? I enjoy dancing and singing to High School Musical with my sister. <laughs> but I'm still a man. <laughs> and the reality is for us guys that... <laughs> the reality is for us as guys is we have a God who is the man. And first and foremost, scriptures say that we are, are the son of God. Guys, let's let him be the man. And then we'll just come alongside and be a man of God. It's okay to ask for help. It's okay to say... I can't do this. I need you. So that's men. <laughs> and I took it upon myself to do some research and ask some ladies, like, hey, what is hard for you guys when it comes to asking for help? And I got way more answers than I ever, I'd even write down half of them. But the underlying thing that we kind of came all to a semi-agreement, and it might not be for everyone, but for women, the hardest part is you're told that you have to have it all together by Pinterest, Instagram, Facebook, whatever, social media. The world says, look this way, act this way, do things this way, be this way, and then you are a woman. I've never found that list in the Bible. I've never known God to say, hey, if you don't have your hair done a certain way, you're not pretty enough. Ladies, it's okay to let your hair down. It's okay to say, hey, I don't have it all together. Yeah, what I'm going to show you is nice, but behind this door, it's still craziness. And guess what? That's okay. 
You have a God who says, I love you, I cherish you, you are precious in my eyes, you are beautiful, you are wonderful, you are a daughter of the one true king. So there comes a point when we got to realize, both as men and women, that it's okay to ask for help and not wait until we literally are crawling on our knees and say, I can't do this anymore. You see, what was so cool about Job, and what I loved reading this story was, the guy didn't hesitate. The hard time comes, the, the, the end of his world, as it would seem, comes, but the dude didn't hesitate because for him, he wasn't just living this everyday life where, oh, I'll, I'll do the checklist with Jesus. No, he had a real relationship with God. I'll, I'll do the checklist with God, but I, I have the real relationship with God. There was a focus, there was a reality to him that he was more worried about God's worthiness compared to God's wealthiness. See, sometimes I I think that we get so caught up in this idea of faith and asking for help and and saying, God, I need you and not being prepared because I'll tell you what, hard times, they don't have a sign coming. They just happen. But Job was prepared. I I even think about the apostle Paul in the Bible. The guy was shipwrecked. He was thrown in jail. He was beaten. He was almost murdered. People hated him. And yet, what did he do? He continued to preach the gospel and live out Jesus Christ's message wherever he went. Because to them, it was their, it was, they were going, they were prepared, and for them, God was worthy enough. He was God. He was creator of all. He sent his son for you and I to die on a cross to take our sins away. He was, that was it, and that was all that mattered, was that he was God. This morning, do you view God as that, or are you viewing him as a spiritual vending machine? What have you done for me lately? You know what I'm saying? Is, is he God? Is he the one who gives you unconditional love so you give him unconditional love back? Or is it, I will love you when you answer this prayer? I will have faith in you when you come through with this prayer, with this question, with this, this issue I have. I, and we begin to push ourselves away and we begin to treat him as nothing more than a vending machine. I have a cat, like I said earlier, two cats actually, one's named Bella and one's named Vader. Vader is one years old, he's a tabby cat, and for those of you who don't have cats, a normal cat size is like four to six pounds, Vader is 18 pounds. It's like a literal trash can walking around our house. He's a heavy sucker, but 18 pounds. And from the moment we got Vader, he would always be so purry and cuddly and cute and, you know, scratch and nip at your leg, and he would just love being around. And I just thought Vader just loved me. Like, I was like, Vader is my cat. Bella, sorry, Vader is mine. And we would just hang out, and it'd be awesome. Just puss in boots, me and cat. That's what it was going to be. So <laughs> Vader, though, obviously loves to eat. The dude's got a bowling ball swinging from his gut. And as I would begin to realize that my responsibility would become, I'd wake up early and I'd, I'd feed them in the morning and then I'd feed them in the evening. And I began to notice that as I fed Vader, he got more cuddly. He got more cute. Until one day I fed Vader, he literally laid flat on his stomach, not lying, flat on his stomach with his face in the bowl, not even eating, just purring. <laughs> just The freaking cat only loved me because I fed him. (laughs) He was just obsessed with food. He knew I gave him food, and so when I gave him food, he would love me in return. And my question for you is this. Are you waiting for God to feed you before you love him in return? Are you waiting for the next time that he shows you the food, that shows you the blessings for you to show him affection back? Or are you loving God? Are you choosing God? Are you choosing faith? Are you choosing him no matter what because he's God? See, what, what, again, I love so much about Job is that for Job, it was simple. God wasn't a glorified lifeline. God was his life. He wasn't just something where, I, hey, I, I, need, I need you now, so come help me now. It was, I need you all the time. 
so that when the hard times came, it was the first choice was to choose faith. It was the natural choice to choose faith. It was the natural choice to choose God because he wasn't just some, help me now, I need to call a friend, give me the 50-50 God on this situation. It was, you're just God and you're here already and thank you. This morning, I don't know where you're at. I don't know if you're going through a hard time or you're struggling, but what I want to say is that is God just simply a lifeline to you? Is, is your faith just simply a lifeline? Or is it your life? Will you stand with me? I just want to pray for a moment. For some of you, maybe you're thinking that. Maybe you're thinking, man, my, this relationship with God, this faith thing I've been doing, it's been nothing more than a glorified lifeline. It's been nothing more than just something I need on occasion. And you're realizing that, no, I need God all the time. So I just want to pray. And if that's you, I want to just give you that chance to pray while I'm praying as well. And ask God that he'd become the central part of your life. That when there is a hard time, it's no longer an option of whether you're going to choose faith or not. You just are faithful. Let's pray. God, I, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for who you are. Father, I thank you for the fact that you love us no matter what, God. That when we're struggling, when we're, when we're in a difficult situation, when, when life seems rough, God, or even when life seems good, it doesn't matter. You still love us. You're still there for us. As Job said, God, it doesn't matter what we have in this world. It's the fact that we have you at the end of it. So let that be our praise. Father, I pray that we don't wait for the end of the world to choose you, the creator of the world. I pray that you are our choice all the time, first and foremost. I thank you. I love you. And may everything we do be glorified to you in your name. Amen. Amen. Pastor Andrew. Sunday services at 9 or 11 a.m.